Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar, how to form a successful security strategy in the new workforce. This event brought to you by Security Magazine is sponsored by Everbridge. I'm your moderator, Maria Henriquez, editor at Security Magazine. Thank you for joining us. Today's presenter is Tracy Reinhold, Chief Security Officer at Everbridge. He is responsible for advancing Everbridge's enterprise level security strategy, as well as working closely with customers and partners to optimize their organizational approach to managing and responding to critical events. Previously, Reinhold was responsible for designing and managing Fannie Mae's enterprise resilience strategy. He established a robust enterprise response model that enabled senior leaders to respond to security and business disruptions in an efficient and consistent manner. Don't forget to submit your questions and later in the program, our presenter will address as many as possible. Today's event is being recorded and archived on securitymagazine.com. And now I am excited to turn it over to today's presenter, Tracy. Thanks, Maria. I appreciate it. Um, as you can see from today's cover slide here, uh, it's, it's a bit nebulous, but I guess the first question is, how do we define the new workforce? So before we could actually design a successful security strategy, I think it's important for us to understand the differences uh, in today's workforce uh, compared to what it was. And I hate to do this, but we, we tend to compare everything pre and sort of post pandemic. So if we think about this before the pandemic, uh, it, security was a fairly straightforward operation. We had large concentrations of employees that were co-located at a designated work site. Uh, and so security was pretty much what we had done for years before. All of a sudden we have a global pandemic and what ends up happening is the workforce becomes more hybrid in nature. So by this is according to Gartner, when, what's on your screen now, about 31% of the workforce globally is in a hybrid model. So what does that really mean? When you look across the spectrum of the panel of the slide that's on your screen, the US leads with 53% and then EU and the UK with 52% and then uh, lower percentages in different parts of the world. However, I think what's important to realize is that hybrid is also, we also have an entire segment of our workforce that is fully remote. So the problem with remote workforce is that it becomes more difficult for us to protect. Uh, and I say that because of the disparate locations that our employees are using every day. But there's still a responsibility from an employer's perspective to provide a duty of care uh, for our employees, regardless of where they are working. So when you think about that, um, so we now know that if we look at this pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, we have a stationary workforce. Now we have a more dynamic workforce. And by dynamic, um, we, we have two things there. We have the hybrid model, we have remote, and we also now have the reintroduction of traveling employees. So those three things complicate the way that we provide protection for our employees. Remember, the job of security is to enable the success of the company. We do that by providing a safe and secure environment in which that company can actually be pr productive and successful, generate revenue, uh, increase uh, market share, uh, brand reputation, all of those things that are encompassed with that. However, it's actually become even more complicated than just what we talked about with a hybrid workforce. When you think about it, there are three types of things that we want to be focused on. Digital risks, physical risks, and enterprise resilience. So let's talk a little bit about what's happened traditionally in the past between the digital and the physical side of security. So organizations don't really care who is responsible for what. What they care about is to ensure that we are providing that 360 degree protective envelope that is necessary for that organization to be successful in whatever endeavor they're doing. The same is true for the public sector as it is for the private sector. 
So digital risks, let's talk a little bit about digital security, uh, which is traditionally uh, held within the realm of the CISO or the Chief Information Security Officer. So that person obviously is responsible for networks, for intrusions, for the introduction of malicious malware, um, for unsolicited attacks from uh, three attack vectors, state-sponsored uh, criminals or hacktivists who are actually interested in not m monetary gain, but merely the idea of disrupting the business. Um, so that has traditionally been where digital security or cybersecurity, if you will, is focused. Physical security is a traditional, in the past, we would always refer to that as guards, gates, and guns. Um, that is no longer an effective way to protect an enterprise. Uh, with the advances in technology, it is, I think it's safe to say that every company, regardless of what they make, do, or produce, is a technology company. No company out there survives without technology. So by separating the physical risks and the digital risks, what you're doing is creating a vacuum. And in that vacuum, risk and vulnerability live because it's either somebody else's job or it's not my job to do that. I'm the physical person or I am the digital person. Well, here's a newsflash. The bad guys don't care who's responsible for what. They want to find a vulnerability and exploit it, whether it's the introduction of cyber uh, warfare via physical access or vice versa. That's what they're looking for. So if companies or organizations do not change the way that they're looking and create a new overarching comprehensive strategy to address risks and, and, and dangers, what they're doing is giving their adversaries an advantage. So by consolidating or merging digital and physical risk, what you're doing is, is closing that alley in which risk and vulnerability lives so that it's more difficult for adverse actors to actually create havoc in your company. So I say this because all of this results back to enterprise resilience. So the convergence of digital and physical and the inclusion of what matters to the company in your protective strategy is actually how you develop enterprise resilience. So when I think about enterprise resilience, what I'm thinking about is how does a business do a couple of things? Identify risks and vulnerabilities, whether digital or physical, how do they visualize those threats? How do they leverage automation to accelerate their response capability to those threats? And how do they make sure that they're protecting the right thing? So when you think about enterprise resilience, what you're really talking about is how fast can we recover from a business disruption so that we can return to revenue faster? Remember what I said earlier is that security's job is to enable the business to be successful. Part of that enablement is reducing the, the downtime associated with a business disruption. So enterprise resilience doesn't necessarily only refer to cyber risk or physical risks. It can also involve facilities management. It can involve HR, it can involve legal, it can involve corporate communications. So a comprehensive enterprise resilience strategy as part of a subset of your successful security strategy should have all of the critical stakeholders at the table uh, before an event actually manifests. So what you want to be able to do is to aggregate and deconflict intelligence so that you know where your potential threats and risks are. Then you want to be able to actually visualize those on, on top of the assets that you have. So as an example, you may want to geolocate everything that is important to you and then use your risk intel feeds that have been aggregated and deconflicted so that it shows where those two things intersect. So by doing that, it allows you to actually leverage automation, machine learning, and AI to actually accelerate your recovery process. 
by accelerating that recovery process, you're reducing the disruption time for the company and you return to revenue faster. So I know that this sounds more like a, a, a business conversation than a security conversation, but I would challenge you that, do we want security to be a business enabler? If so, then we really have to understand what's important to the business and how we protect it. So when you develop that strategy, be thinking about the hybrid workforce, the remote for workforce, our travelers, the critical capabilities of the organization and how your security posture is designed so that the strategy reflects what's important to the company. If you do it that way, then you become a value center for the organization. Can we just be honest that says that in the past, security has been a cost center. But by creating a successful security strategy that encompasses the new way of working, all of a sudden you're transitioning from a cost center to a value center by reducing your downtime and bringing the organization back online faster, more effectively, and more efficiently. So I think those are important things when we think about how we're going to do these, how we're going to face these new challenges. Um, and I will, I would, I would argue that what got us here is not going to get us there. In other words, we need to embrace technology. We need to embrace diversity of thought. We need to encourage security leaders that are new to the industry uh, to stick with security and to develop what the future looks like for us so that the organization can successfully maintain its resilient posture going on for decades. So, when we think about that, we talked a little bit about, you know, the remote field workers, travelers, etc., all of the things that are on your slide now. But what I will ask you is this. Do you feel comfortable that you have done everything that you can possibly do to ensure, to ensure the security and safety of your organization? If the board were to ask you as a security professional, are we protected from ransomware? The appropriate response is we're as protected as we can be. If a security professional says that they are 100% protected, they're probably not being completely honest because the very law of probabilities says that that's an impossibility. Our adversaries have to be right once, we have to be right all of the time. So part of that is how you message your security strategy to senior leadership. How do you make that security strategy resonate with non-security professionals at the C level? The way that you do that, I mean, we can talk about duty of care and the other things, but one of the biggest assets that you can bring to the table is a communications capability that allows you to discuss the value that security brings to the organizations in terms that resonate with the revenue generators of the organization. So I'll say that again, it has to resonate with the revenue generators of the corporation because they are the ones that the board shareholders and stakeholders listen to. So develop that ability to communicate your vision and your strategy so that they can be your champions when you need resources to actually execute against a strategy that will protect their ability to make money. So we talked a little bit about how enterprise resilience involves all different aspects of the organization. It's important to understand what are the key capabilities that allow that company to be successful and then to build your security strategy around those critical capabilities. So if you are in financial services, for example, you may want to go to the capital markets room and ask the leader of the capital markets room, what is it that you do here and what is important to you? Your initial pushback will be, well, you're the security person. Why do you care about capital markets? Because it's the business you are supposed to be protecting. And in order to protect it, you need to understand what's important to that part of the organization so that you can design your strategy to protect the most important assets, facilities, and digital environments 
that your company possesses. The other thing that is challenging in today's workforce is the idea, I, I was talking with a company the other day that has 85,000 employees. Pre-pandemic, um, they were all located in three office buildings. Post-pandemic, 90% of their workforce is remote. So now, instead of having three facilities to protect, they have about 85,000 facilities to protect. One of the challenges with that is locating your employees so that you can ensure that bad things that will affect them are brought to your attention so that you can protect them. Employees in today's workforce have an expectation that the company will look out for their best interests regardless of where they are physically located. So one of the challenges post pandemic is that there has been a migration of employees relocating to either less expensive areas of the country or the world or areas that they want to live because they're no longer tied to a specific facility. I had a security professional ask me the other day, I'm having trouble finding out where my workforce is so that I can geofence their location and provide threat information to them. This is where partnerships uh, are critical for you as a security professional. Every employee in your organization pays taxes. And depending on their physical location, it will depend on how much or how less, how little taxes that they pay. So get together with finance and get together with HR so that you know the last location where they are. Then you can use those locations to actually put them on a geofenced map and then overlay threat information that could adversely affect their ability to do their job. Um, so it's about being creative, it's about being open-minded, and it's about leveraging the new technologies and capabilities that society has at its disposal. We are no different than any other part of an organization. We have to keep current, and we have to be able to do this in a way that doesn't impede the business's ability to generate revenue and be sustainable. Remember, the goal here is resilience, and part of resilience is flexibility and agility. If a company has to be that way, then security has to be that way as well. So what I will tell you is that technology has enabled us to do amazing things in the security world, uh, one of which is to look at threats from the inside out and from the outside in. In other words, you're, you will want to deploy a PSIM solution to integrate legacy CCTV access controls, all the other technology that you have, as opposed to going to the board and asking for all new equipment. It's too expensive. So in order to do that, think about what it means to the company. If you can do that by leveraging a PSIM solution that allows you to integrate legacy equipment into your command center, whether it's a SOC, a, a GSOC if you're a global company, or just your operations center, depending on the size of your organization. You're also going to want to be able to collect threat information uh, from outside the organization that could adversely affect both employees and facilities and uh, secure, uh, I'm sorry, and supply chain routes, those sorts of things. So in order to do that, you have to aggregate intelligence. So early in my, earlier I should say, in my professional life, I ran the intelligence program for the FBI. And the problem with intelligence is too much of it becomes just white noise. So technology has allowed us to put together algorithms that actually reduce the amount of intelligence that we get to only the things that we care about. Because if you don't, you will, it will become white noise and you will miss critical information that will allow you to better protect your organization. So getting that information, and this is where it's important with this new hybrid workforce, because suddenly, our, our scope of responsibility expands over massive geographic regions uh, every single day of the year. Um, so that's one of the challenges that you're going to have that can be actually optimized by leveraging technology that allows you to see more, discern more, and act quicker 
uh, based on what technology allows us to do. And I think these are really important things to think about as we move through developing our security strategy. So a couple of assumptions when we think about this, right? Um, when I say that the definition of the work environment is fluid, what I'm talking about is that somebody may work in the office on Monday, uh, be traveling to another country Tuesday and Wednesday, and then the following week be at a remote location that is not necessarily their office of record. So part of our ability to do that is dynamic location services that will we can leverage to determine where people are at any time of the day or night so that we can better protect them. Now, we talked a little while ago about the importance of communication. So part of the problem with technology is that if technology is deployed without trust, it is absolutely worthless. Nobody will use it because they are afraid that the company is going to misuse it or use it in ways that they're not supposed to. So as you roll out new technology and tools and applications on phones that allow you to protect your employees, you also at the same time have to have, for lack of a better term, an internal marketing campaign about why you're doing it and how you're going to use it. That marketing campaign has to come from two directions, from the top down and from the bottom up. So you need to go to your C-suite and you need to get them to download the app. You need to get them to use it and you need to get them to be vocal about it. And you need to do the same thing with your entry-level employees. And then what you do is you can actually use that technology to send notices to employees on their mobile phones while they're at work. And the key is if you do this right, one person sitting next to the other one will get the message maybe of an early dismissal. The other one won't. And they'll say, well, how come you got it and I didn't? Well, I downloaded the app. So it's a process and it's a, I hate this term, but it's a journey um, to get that acceptance to a point where it becomes actually uh, something that is beneficial to the organization. So the other thing, we talked a little bit about information being key, but that's about deconflicting. The other one is how do you, how do you become more proactive as opposed to reactive? So part of that is through good intelligence. Part of that is through technology, but part of it is all through, also through mindset. So when you have an, something that happens left of boom or before an incident, the more you do on that side, the less you have to do on this side. Now, understanding you will never be at a point where you can predict or prevent all bad things from happening. But if you can reduce them through the leveraging of intelligence and the utilization of technology, you're actually preventing disruption to the business before it actually even manifests. And that's where automation comes in handy. So one of the things that security is responsible for, and this is a, it's a simple example, but I think it's effective, um, if you happen to live in an area that is prone to tornadic activity, seconds matter. So if your GSOC is responsible for providing weather information to employees um, to get them out of harm's way, you can actually automate that based on a feed from the National Weather Service. If it's an F2 or above tornado, it will automatically send out an alert to the people that are geolocated in the impact area for the storm. This takes the decision making away from the human, which actually takes longer. Hurricanes are a different story. You have weeks, you can watch them coming. Uh, tornadic activity, seconds matter. So by automating that, you're actually reducing the amount of time it takes for the security team to provide that heads up to an employee who could be in the impact zone, thereby saving a life. That is huge, and that is where technology really helps us um, to, to advance our position in the organization as we move forward. So what, what, we're, what we're really talking about here is leveraging technology, um, becoming masters of communication so that you can actually provide the required resources 
that the company needs to maintain a resilient posture in today's competitive market. So I'm going to, we're going to talk about something that hopefully will be second nature to everyone, but unfortunately is not always done in the best possible light. And that is how do we do an after action? How do we do a hot wash? How do we uh, do an analysis of an event? So every organization has a different name for this, but really what we're talking about is how do we improve our ability to protect ourselves and our companies um, as part of our security strategy. So if you have an incident and you did seven things right and you did three things wrong, human nature says we focus on the three that we did wrong um, and we do it in a way that is not necessarily constructive. Perhaps a better approach is to look at this from the perspective of these seven things we did exceptionally well. What parts of these seven things can we apply to the three that we didn't do well? Um, so that the next time out of the gate, we have the ability to do better for our organization. Now, part of your successful work security strategy is exercising. OK, so what you don't want to do is the first time you deploy technology, or the first time you stand up your command post is during a real event. And I say that because security does this all the time. But what we sometimes don't do is include senior leadership in our exercises or we don't make our exercises realistic enough because we want to be successful during the exercise for fear that it could adversely impact our budget if we don't do well in the eyes of our executives. It's actually a self-fulfilling prophecy. You want to be able to have an exercise that, that identifies real deficiencies and then put together strategies to mitigate those deficiencies during an exercise so that when it becomes real, it's not the first time you've looked at this. The other part of our security strategy has to be and this sort of doesn't make a lot of sense on the surface you have to expect the unexpected and i say that with an eye towards the pandemic a lot of organizations had a pandemic response plan in place but that plan was designed with the understanding that it would actually never be deployed because nobody could envision a pandemic that lasted for years so part of that expecting the unexpected is to incorporate agility and flexibility in your plan. Do not become married to a single course of action because that course of action could prove to be ineffective and inefficient in the face of the true uh, pandemic or disaster. You pick the next disaster and plan for it. It's very complicated and it's not it's not as straightforward as we would like to think that it is. So, so let, let me just walk you through what will happen in a good security strategy uh, from my perspective, but with a caveat that I am by no means an expert or have all of the answers. I'm just sharing what worked for me uh, in, in my career and in, in my roles as CSOs at two organizations that one of which was a domestic organization and the other was global. So the first thing you want to be able to do is if you look at the continuum of the security apparatus, you have your table stakes, whether it's digital security or physical security. From a digital security perspective, are you putting in the vulnerability testing? Are you doing the normal blocking and tackling associated with protecting the network um, from malicious actors? That, that's a given, that's expected. There's nothing surprising there. From a physical perspective, are you putting in your access control? Are you doing your monitoring? Are you providing physical security to the employees? Are you doing the investigations associated with workplace issues? Those are all table stakes uh, requirements for any security operation. What you want to think about is, am I a strategic thinker as the leader in my security team. 
Am I thinking in terms of what will make my company more productive and competitive in today's landscape? It's not the job of the business. It's the job of everybody. So security has a, has a role in that. Remember, what's our job? To enable the business. So by doing that, we have to think strategically about what we do and why we do it. We need to transition in today's society with the fluidity of the workforce, the, the, the transient nature of employees. We have to be thinking about how do I articulate value and how do I keep my employees safe and my company productive? So part of that is embracing technology. Part of that is opening your aperture from the risk and threat perspective to think about things that you hadn't thought about in the past. If you do that, you will become more open to the idea that different ways of protecting the organization are what you need. Diversity in your workforce is critical when you think about the ability to protect the company and the organization. If you don't do that, you will fail. The other thing is, if you are not technically savvy, then you need to hire people on your team that are, and you need to empower them to educate you as a security leader about why technology is the future of security. It's faster, it's more effective, it's more efficient, uh, and it's less expensive. So think about when you're doing that. The, the other thing that I will tell you as you develop your security strategy, you need to think about, we talked a little bit about communications. How do you communicate your business case for the capital expenditure associated with getting what you need to protect the company, right? Whether it's heat sensors in the lighting fixtures, whether it is destination elevators, whether it's a state-of-the-art GSOC, it doesn't matter. You cannot argue for the funds necessary for that if you can't relate it back to the business. You have to be able to make a business case just like a business line entity in the organization would do. If you do that, it makes more sense to the people that are responsible for funding the security process for the company. So be thinking about it in terms of we need destination elevators because uh, by, by being a more secure building, we're preventing disruptions from the unauthorized access of individuals into our workspace. Um, this will actually provide a better environment for our employees so they can be more productive. Uh, now, think about that again when you're thinking about geolocating employees that are remote or hybrid. They still expect and the company still expects for you to advise them of potential threats or disruptions to their business world. Because even though they're at home or in on Maui, uh, they're still working for the company. So because of that, there's an expectation of a duty of care that they are looked after by the organization for which they are working. It's pretty straightforward. It's not overly complicated. It's just the way we do it has changed. If you happen to be an organization that has field workers or remote workers, um, the ability to provide them with the capability to push a panic alarm that doesn't notify the person that they're afraid of is really important. Technology allows us to do that so that the adversary sees nothing unusual on their phone, but you in the GSOC are aware that there's a problem and can affect a recovery operation or a rescue operation with the assistance of local law enforcement. All of these things are totally within your remit as security professionals. But remember, at the end of the day, you have one goal and one goal only, and that is to ensure the resilience of your organization. Resilience post-pandemic has become a board-level discussion topic. 70% of CEOs are now requiring that a resilience plan be in place for their organization post-pandemic. So if anything came good out of the pandemic, it was the heightened awareness of the importance of resilience 
and resilience and security. And re remember, resilience is not just business continuity. Resilience is enterprise wide and incorporates all aspects of the business that are critical for the sustainability of that business going forward. So unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on where you sit in the organization, usually that responsibility falls to the security team. CSOs usually have a remit for both physical security, crisis management, business continuity, um, and executive protection. All of those things are important, but done without the collaborative efforts of your digital security team, you're doing nothing more than exacerbating the gap that already exists between the digital and the physical world. Remember earlier, we talked about every company is a technology company. Think about your remote workers and how you're protecting the devices that they're using. Obviously, we want them all to use company issued devices. Is that a realistic expectation, even though it's a requirement? I won't answer that. I'll leave that to you to decide in your own organizations. But trust me when I tell you that as complicated as things are today, it will be even more complicated tomorrow. And that's what makes our job both challenging and fun. If it were paint by numbers, anybody could do it. Um, security professionals who understand strategy and understand the value that they bring to an organization are actually exceptionally well placed um, to ensure the resilience of an organization, the return to revenue and the sustainability of a company going forward. So with that, Maria, I'm going to turn it back over to you um, for any questions that we might have uh, from the audience. Well, thank you, Tracy, for a great presentation. Before we have Tracy address some of the questions that were submitted throughout the program, I wanted to remind you that we would love your feedback in our webinar survey to help improve our programs. And now for our very first question, hybrid workers can find themselves in many places. In that context, can you talk about identifying threats before they happen? Sure. So part of the responsibility of the security team is to have a good intelligence apparatus. Um, you know, intelligence led operations are critically important regardless of where you are. So part of the way that we do that is there are thousands of disparate intelligence sources around the world. So having the ability to aggregate all of that information, um, but then to use the requirements of your employees to reduce that white noise so that you can start to get ahead of threats. Optimally, the goal for a good security team is to identify potential disruptions and mitigate them before they manifest. That cannot be done without the ability to aggregate and deconflict intelligence. That is so important. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's one piece that is just coming into its own. And I will argue that be very careful of machine learning only. And I say that because sometimes it's not what's said, but how it's said. So the combination between machine learning, artificial intelligence and human analysts from an intelligence perspective is really how you get to the very kernel of truth that you need to put together a protective strategy that can mitigate that before it actually manifests. And that applies regardless of where your employees are. So we talked a little bit earlier about the importance of having the ability to geofence locations. When you do that, if you're, let's say it's, it's your employee's home address because they're working for you, then you, you put the filters into your intelligence apparatus that tells you these are the areas that I am concerned about. And it could be something as simple as a traffic disruption um, in a neighborhood. Uh, unfortunately, it could also be something a lot more significant. It could be a bank robbery, it could be an active shooter, um, it could be tornadic activity. All of those things, you want to make sure that you have the ability to look at them and then overlay them where your employees are located and then use automation and technology to provide them with an alert so that they can take the appropriate action. Okay. 
And Tracy, you briefly mentioned protecting employees when they travel. Do you believe companies need a travel risk program in place to successfully protect their employees? So I think with, with well, first of all, <laughs> all you have to do actually is go to an airport today um, and you will realize how much longer the wait times are, which tells you that more people are traveling. Um, so I think that a travel risk management program or a safe journey management, whatever you want to call it, is really important. And, and so a couple of parts of that that I want to talk about. Um, one of the things is being able to ingest PNR or uh, traveler, uh, travel agency information into your travel risk management platform so that you can determine where somebody is supposed to be based on that, which is great. The problem is not everybody uses the company authorized travel agency. So that's where dynamic location services are really important to determine whether through an IP address or an iPod or, or your phone uh, signal where that person is on any given time. Um, the other part of this is part of part of that is incorporating that into your overall global security strategy. In other words, your travel risk management has to be tied to your GSOC so that you have a single screen to look at and you can determine whether or not you have travelers in harm's way. The other thing, there's two other things that you need to think about when you're designing a good travel risk management program. One of them are is health services. If an employee becomes ill in a country that they are not a citizen of, Part of the duty of care is, do we have the ability to provide them with medical care um, in country where they are? So when you look for travel risk management uh, companies, think about that. Um, the other thing is, and unfortunately this was manifest in the Ukrainian war, do we have the ability to evacuate our employees as part of our safe journey or travel risk management program? So you want to look at so the short answer is yes, but a little bit more detailed is you want to look at three components, normal safe journey management by ingesting PNRs, being able to track where employees are anywhere in the world. The other part is, do you have the capabilities to put a medical resource against an employee? And thirdly, do you have the ability to evacuate an employee um, if you have to do that? So all of that is to say, if you do not have a travel risk management program, you should look very hard at getting one um, because that is also part of our duty of care to our employees, especially when we have a global workforce. Okay, and a follow-up question to that, Tracy. Should a travel risk management program account for COVID-19 still or for future pandemics? So it's interesting. The CDC just came out with new guidelines uh, on, on COVID, which I think are interesting. Um, I would say, and, and I want to go back to what I, something I said earlier, and that is anticipate the unexpected, right? So what you don't want to do is to create a travel risk management program for your organization that looks at what threats were pre-pandemic. Um, and I say that because of two reasons. Those who, who considered themselves road warriors, for lack of a better term, before the pandemic may not have traveled in the last two and a half years. And I will tell you that travel security is a perishable skill. Um, situational awareness, um, your ability to um, determine threats when you're in a foreign environment uh, are not something that you retain for a long time. So I will, I would say that Travel risk management offerings vary around the world, but I would I would all I would caution to look for one that is as holistic as possible, that is inclusive as as opposed to exclusive of capabilities, because you really don't know what the future holds. But if you train your teams to expect the unexpected, all of the sudden. When that happens, the team has the ability to pivot. Um, if they can't pivot, then you're putting your employees at risk. And if you looked at getting a travel risk management program 
on, on purely the fundamentals and nothing more, chances are something will manifest over the next several years that will have a significant impact on the way that employees travel today and tomorrow. I, I'll give you a real example. Um, I w I've been traveling for a while now. Um, when I first traveled to New Zealand uh, earlier this year, they were still requiring employees to take COVID tests upon arrival and every three to seven days after. If you got sick during that time frame, does your travel risk management capability have the ability to get you out of New Zealand? Yes or no. If they don't, then is that the right fit for you? The other thing that I would, I would caution is that if you decide to use a software system for your global security operations center, and it also offers travel risk management from a vendor management perspective, take a look at what you're looking at and whether or not that fits your needs, um, because it makes it much easier for your GSOC in the middle of the night to handle that incoming question from a global traveler. Um, so it's not enough just to have travel risk management or to have a GSOC. Part of it is also having the staff that has the requisite skills to actually manage that critical incident when it's manifesting in your company. Um, I think we all know that, that we outsource a lot of our GSOC work uh, through different um, uh, companies that we leverage for that, uh, contractors. Um, it's important, it's tough work, it's shift work, it's hard to staff, I get that. Um, but I will tell you that as a CSO, I, I treat my contract uh, GSOC operators the same as I do my full-time employees. It's sort of one team, one fight. Um, and because of that, the turnover is reduced. The training associated with learning a new travel risk management platform or a new integrated PSIM system is greatly reduced. So at the end of the day, what, what it does is provide a more stable environment for the company so that we can enable their success. Okay, and one last question about travel risk management. Are there any frameworks that you recommend organizations use to inform their travel risk management program? So, so what I would say fr from that perspective is you wanna look at three key tenets when you're looking at a travel risk management platform, right? It's just like what we just talked about. Safe journey management, security operations, and medical services. If you look at those three, and it's not enough just so you want to dissect each one of the three to make sure that they have the capabilities that your organization requires. If you're a company that doesn't travel, th then, then it's not something to worry about. If you're a, a company that uh, only travels occasionally, you may be okay, but you're hard pressed to find an organization today, whether it's a, a mid cap company or above that doesn't have an excessive number of travelers. So think about that from your duty of care perspective and think about incorporating that into your overall security strategy. So when you think about that and, and I'm kind of wandering a little bit, so, so just bear with me on this. When you think about that successful strategy that we talked about today, think about it this way. Can you visualize the threat? In other words, can you get intelligence that informs you of emerging threats, risks, and vulnerabilities? Can you then take that threat information and visually look at it over the assets of your organization to determine whether or not there's an intersection? Thirdly, can you automate your response capabilities um, through technology to accelerate your recovery process? And lastly, unfortunately, oftentimes there's also a requirement that you have the capability to physically evacuate employees, provide medical services to them in an area that they are unfamiliar with. Now, no company has that capability out of the gate. Um, most travel risk managers or management companies maintain uh, contract doctors and nurses and contract evacuation specialists 
Um, and they also, some of them, something else to look at from a security lens, is do they have vetted contractors that you can leverage for executive protection in areas where your EP team is unable to go? Because at the end of the day, if you have them going into uh, an area of the world that is high risk, and if you're a U.S. company, you may not be able to bring your executive protection team into that country. Some travel risk management organizations have vetted contractors globally that you can leverage for that. So that is part of travel risk management because you can't always leverage your own teams. What you don't want to do is to go into an area that is high risk and accidentally hire the adversary as your executive protection team because it is not going to end well for you. So take advantage of those organizations that have already done that heavy lift that have validated contractors that you can use to protect your traveling employees in areas of the world where you do not have access. So all of that, what we're talking about is a holistic approach to security. So it's not enough to do one or the other. I want to be, a, I want to look at the digital threat. I want to look at the physical threat. Travelers are not my responsibility or I don't have responsibility for the PSIM solution. I'm only looking at external threats. It's really about creating a holistic organization that effectively protects and enables the company to be successful. So if you are the, the security leader of your organization, it's not necessary that you know how to work your security platform or that you know all the ins and outs about uh, travel risk management or digital security. Your job as the overall leader of that organization is to be strategic in nature, to have good communication skills, to be able to talk to senior leadership, to be able to talk to the board, but more importantly, to be able to talk to them in terms that resonate with them. Speak the language of business because that's what revenue generating parts of your business understand. So when you're making a business case for an expenditure, when you're making a business case for an, an advanced security posturing position, think about it in terms that the company thinks about things. If you do it in that way, it will make obvious sense to them. And then use your time as a strategic leader to develop champions in the C-suite that will go to bat for security because it's important to them, just like it's important to you. If you do that, you will be able to develop and deploy a robust security team that has the best interest of the company at, at heart. The, the last thing I will say is this, and it's a little bit off point, but part of your strategy has to be to educate your security employees about the business. Have each one of them be able to give an elevator speech. But here's the key. That elevator speech should not be about security. It should be about the core business. So that when they step into an elevator with an executive vice president of a certain part of the business, they know what that does and they can talk intelligently about it. And they can say how that that security team enables them to be successful. Believe me when I tell you that resonates with people that do not have a security mindset. Our job is not to be the department of no. Our job is to be the department of how can we get you where you need to go safely so that we can enable the business to be successful and resilient. Okay, thank you, Tracy. Um, one more question for you. What are the biggest challenges when implementing operational resilience and how do these challenges differ across industries? It's funny you say that because the challenges are, are, are kind of universal. And part of it, and, and I say the biggest challenge is getting buy-in and understanding what it means to the organization. Resilience from a perspective of an organization is the ability to sustain itself and to recover from disruption quickly. So what we want to do is we want to break down those stovepipes. That's the biggest challenge. I'm a business continuity person. I'm a crisis management person. I'm a finance person, et cetera. 
identifying those critical capabilities that enable the company to be resilient and to sort of sustain itself is important. The other most challenging part of this is how do I decide what's important, right? If you have, if everybody is important, then nobody is important. There are certain aspects of a business, depending on what the business is. This is where, to your point, it's a little bit different. If you're a retail company, if you're a financial services company, if you're a manufacturing company, those critical capabilities will be different for each one of them. Identifying them and identifying key stakeholders and getting the buy-in associated with maintaining a resilient posture for the company is what's the hardest because it's not about what you do or what he does it's about what we do to enable the company to be successful so breaking down those barriers horizontal integration um, open lines of communication um, and demystifying the process so what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to say from i'm i'm responsible for resilience what does that mean so if you're a chief risk officer in a financial services company that may mean regulatory risk but by myopically focusing on that, you're leaving yourself vulnerable to other types of risk. So educating yourself about all risks and how do you position the organization to recover quickly from a disruption and maintain a resilient posture that leads to the return to revenue, that's what's important. Part of it is having a dialogue. Part of it is explaining what you mean. And part of it is listening to your stakeholders and empowering them to be be part of that journey towards resilience. It's not an us or them, it's we. We as a company must be resilient. And in order to do that, we have to understand what that means to us in our specific vertical, whether it's re retail, manufacturing, et cetera, and understand what's important, how do we protect it, and how do we recover it from it as quickly as possible. If we do that right, then we will be a resilient company and we will be around when other companies are no longer relevant. So I think in that way, that's probably the biggest challenge that we face in the resilience space is educating, opening the aperture and gaining acceptance. All right. It looks like that's all the time that we have today. Please join me in thanking Tracy Reinhold for his great presentation, as well as our sponsor, Everbridge. If you do have any additional questions or comments, please don't hesitate to click the email us button on the console. Please also visit securitymagazine.com for the archive of this presentation, as well as other information about upcoming events. We appreciate your time and hope that you have found this webinar to be a valuable experience.